it's a great honor uh, and privilege to introduce uh, our friend and colleague, Dr. Dennis Poe, uh, who has oh, made sure. tremendous advances in the understanding of the eustachian tube. Uh, he's uh, been a pioneer in this area, and we really appreciate his uh, taking the time today to join us uh, to give us an overview on the eustachian tube. Thank you. Dennis, thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you today. And uh, it, it's been uh, too long since I've been out to visit the clinic. So I, I hope I can get out there one of these days when it's allowable again. Well, so uh, one of the most common things that I'm asked now that uh, eustachian tube surgery, especially balloon dilation, is becoming increasingly mainstream. Uh, people still have a lot of questions about, well, who's the right patient? What's the phenotype we should be looking for? And how do we evaluate the patient's uh, eustachian tubes? How, how do we evaluate function? So I, I thought we'd have a fairly clinically focused uh, chat here because I, I've been finding that this is very helpful for folks, the hard lessons that we've learned on how to sort out this little organ. Uh, my disclosure is I uh, am a consultant with the Clarence Corporation who makes one of the balloons. Uh, they pay me for my time and expenses, but I don't have any equity interest in the company. I don't have any royalties from their products. So we look at the eustachian tube a little differently now. The middle ear mastoid is a, it's a uh, cavity, like a sinus and the eustachian tube is a long dynamic ostium that aerates that sinus. So this is a longitudinal section through a cadaver, uh, cadaver head. And uh, Dr. Slattery was just reminding me how we as a group did some cadaver dissections and research on eustachian tube 16 years ago, everyone gathered here at Harvard. This might be one of those dissections. So this is a longitudinal section through a human uh, head this is the nasopharyngeal orifice. Here's the cartilaginous eustachian tube narrowing down to its narrowest part here at the junction, that's the isthmus. And then it widens back out in the bony portion to the middle ear. The length here from the cartilaginous portion from the nasopharynx, it's about 25 millimeters in most adults. Um, let's keep in mind two important points. The eustachian tube is not straight. It's actually quite curved. You can see where this air contrast here uh, with a patchless eustachian tube, it curves significantly medially, and then it turns laterally toward the ear, toward the temporal bone. Now, in a normal patient who's not patchless, the torus is going to be thicker here, and that accentuates that curvature. Also, the higher we get up toward the temporal bone, the closer we're getting to the internal carotid artery. So we'll keep those things in mind as surgeons. So what we've learned from endoscopic work is most of the pathology is in this cartilaginous portion. It functions like a valve opening and closing. So we want to learn to evaluate that valve. Here we see it closed. These are right eustachian tubes, that's the torus. And we look for that bulge in the anterolateral or the membranous wall versus the cartilage wall or the posteromedial wall. And the eustachian tube follows that membranous wall there to the lumen. So this is the open position when the levator and the tensor muscles are contracting. So we wanna work on getting this view down the lumen of the eustachian tube. So we get that view, usually not with a zero degree endoscope as we've been taught. You can barely see the lumen there an angled view, either with your fiber optic or with 30 or 45 degree endoscopes is going to give you that view. These are right eustachian tubes. Here's the torus, adenoid. And we want to see into the lumen. We want to see both walls, that membranous wall and the cartilaginous wall. So um, once we're in that position, we have the patients vocalizing ka, ka, ka. So we see just the levator moving in the floor and it's rotating the torus medially then do a swallow for a normal physiological open and a yawn for a wide maximal effort. Also vocalizing ah, sometimes people would do better with a yawn versus an ah. 
Um, so this is what that looks like with a fiber. This is my most common tool. Left nasal cavity, left torus adenoid. That was the vomer you just saw. So to see the eustachian tube, we turn the scope 90 degrees so I can flex it back and forth across the vomer. Now we're looking past the vomer to the right torus. Now I don't like looking sideways, so I'm going to turn the scope to bring the picture upright. And now we've got the same view that you would with a 45 degree endoscope through the right nostril. And that's how we're going to look at those walls. So here again, this is from Schutnik's text, Sando's work. Uh, this is the medial cartilaginous lamina. Here it is in a cadaver dissection. And that's the cartilage structure, the skeleton of the torus tubarius. So these are left eustachian tubes. There's the lumen. And this is that membranous wall, Osman's fat, the tensor veli palatini. Here's that muscle, tensor muscle in the, in the membranous wall. And here is the levator muscle in the floor. So we want to see both walls, cartilaginous wall, the membranous wall. So here's what that looks like with a zero degree endoscope, left side, left torus, you don't see the lumen very well. So now here's a 45 degree scope view. Now we see both walls, membranous wall, cartilaginous wall. Here it is in a swallow. The first thing that happens, the levator elevates and it pulls the torus medially, a little adenoid up there. Now it holds it out as a scaffold against which the tensor is going to open the lumen. So watch that in very slow motion, levator, medial rotation of the torus, and now watch the tensor open the valve. Now it's open, and then both muscles are going to relax simultaneously to close it. So this one-two effect, you can see it in real time. You don't have to do it in slow motion. The levator followed by the tensor, and how well does it open? So we've been trained to look at the torus, but really we want to look at the valve. We want to look at these two walls, the membranous wall, the cartilaginous wall. Here's what that looks like on an endoscopic exam in the left side. This is the torus, big cobblestone and lots of inflammation. That was the ca, ca, ca. Here's the swallow. Not great opening with that swallow. It opens only partially right there. Bulbous, uh, pale edema right there that you're seeing. Not very good opening with the other swallows. Here that is in slow motion. Here goes the levator. And look how this torus, it's thickened. It was thrusted anteriorly, partially closing the valve. So this is how we're gonna be evaluating a series of cases here later. So let's look at that fiber optic exam again. I look at the nose, sinuses, the larynx for all other causes that might be uh, causing inflammation. Park the endoscope in the nasopharynx, turn it 90 degrees like you just saw. Now I'm gonna write, write the camera so I don't have to look sideways. This is a right patchless eustachian tube. We see that lateral cartilaginous lamina here, but a concave defect in the membranous wall. There's the ca, ca, ca. There's a swallow and we can see the lumen is wide open there with a yawn and this valve is never closing. Let's look back, let's look at across the adenoid now to the left side, left torus. Now here we've got some mucus in the way. So I'm gonna do everything I can to get around that. I can have them sniff, swallow. In this case, I'll just push the mic, push the endoscope through it now I can see both walls. That's the view you want. Ka, ka, ka. There's the swallow, that one, two, levator, tensor. And now a yawn to look at that lumen. And that valve is never closing. It's a patchless eustachian tube. So that's the systematic way you're gonna look at that. A Couple of pathological examples. This is a right side allergic rhinitis, chronic effusion. We see the torus is thick, cobblestoning, that's lymphoid hyperplasia, very severe anterior thrusting here with swallows, even though the adenoid's only barely touching the torus. Watch when she swallows. Anterior thrusting of this thickened torus, closing the lumen at the time it's supposed to be opening. So in static view, you wouldn't appreciate that the adenoid is significant here, 
But in a dynamic view, you can see how that's very significant to help this patient. Um, if she doesn't respond to allergy treatments, we're gonna wanna do a lateral adenoidectomy and get rid of some of this tubal tonsil tissue, maybe balloon as well. Now contrast that to this allergic rhinitis patient. Intense inflammation here at the orifice, even bulbous edema right there. But look at the lumen. This is the right side. There's that membranous wall. It's atrophic. That yellow is Ostman's fat being seen through the submucosa and, and mucosa that's very, very thin, atrophic. So you've got this paradox in allergic disease. It's chronic. Patches of atrophy that you can get in the nose, sinuses, nasopharynx, and in the lumen of the eustachian tube. So if you get that in the valve of the eustachian tube, you can actually be at risk for developing a patchless eustachian tube in spite of intense inflammation elsewhere uh, in the nose, nasopharynx, and even the eustachian tube orifice. So it's not just what's going on at the orifice. You have to look into the valve to really uh, see where the pathology is relevant. Let's look at a couple examples of, of uh, adenoid hypertrophy. So this right side, this patient has some chronic effusion. We see the torus here, very thickened, cobblestone lymphoid hyperplasia, that's adenoid-like tissue. And the, it, it, the torus bumps up against the adenoid here. Watch what happens when she swallows. There's severe anterior thrusting of the torus. It's trapped between the adenoid and the lateral pharyngeal wall. It never opens. And of course, she's got an effusion. Now contrast that to this side. We have an equal, if not larger volume of adenoid, but there's a concavity in it that's accommodating this torus. The torus is also thickened, but the lumen looks pretty good. Look at this huge adenoid. That's the torus on the left. So back to the right side, this lumen opens perfectly fine because the inflammation does not extend deep into the lumen. It's not interfering with the valve function and it's not causing uh, anterior thrusting. So it's not just about the volume of the adenoid hypertrophy, it's how it's impacting on the torus during swallows and yawns. So we think of eustachian tube dysfunction as a spectrum now from complete obstruction all the way up to patches of atrophy from chronic inflammation or weight loss causing a patchless eustachian tube. So these are all left ears and their corresponding eustachian tubes. We have here intense inflammation from Samter's triad. Everything's uh, thick and inflamed mucosa and you've got a middle ear effusion. This valve never opens. A lesser degree of inflammation, this can open some of the time and we're getting some air into the middle ear. So we have negative pressure, retraction, but no effusion. This one only has a problem when this person flies. And you can see the inflammation is just limited to this band of redundant mucosa here in the floor. And so when they visit you in the office, they've got a normal tympanogram, normal tympanic membrane. This person has atrophy in the membranous wall here, and it's a patchless eustachian tube. And we can see that with excursions of the tympanic membrane with the opposite nostril closed, ipsilateral nasal breathing. Now, patients with allergic disease are particularly prone to patchless, and they can fool you because when they are active with their disease, they can block up and even get into middle ear effusion. But if they're over-medicated or their disease is quiescent, they can go back on that spectrum and actually become patchless. And they'll fool you because they'll tell you just constantly that their ear is blocked, it feels full, there's pressure, um, and they don't differentiate necessarily between going back and forth on this spectrum. You have to ask about autophony and look at their eustachian tube and tympanic membrane situation to sort that out. When we see inflammation, we grade it. This is a validated scale from normal to mild, to moderate and severe, never opening. Uh, so we, we score those and we determine how, if, if a patient needs a balloon dilation, this is what we use to determine how long we're gonna blow up the balloon. The maximum is two minutes, uh, but if I see lesser inflammation, just mild, 
uh, I don't want to make them patchless, so I'll dial that down. Uh, maybe a minute and a half, maybe just a minute. I've even done as little as 30 seconds. So to critically assess the obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction, the most common situation that we face with, it's a multi uh, focal uh, 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 process. So starting with the history, if it's obstructive, they should be barrow challenged when they fly, scuba, diving. Uh, they may have a history of otitis media. They shouldn't uh, be able to easily do a modified Valsalva. Um, so a modified Valsalva, nose and mouth closed. The, uh, you, you gently elevate the intranasal pressure with a mild nose blow and simultaneously swallow. So you're using the muscles to open the eustachian tube, not a forced air Valsalva, which has more risk for blowing up the uh, uh, sensory neural hearing loss and vertigo if they overpressure. So this is much more effective. It's how the scuba divers do it. I teach all the patients how to do it if they're old enough to learn. And generally, if they're obstructive, they cannot do this or it's, or it's difficult for them. Um, have to ask about autophony. They usually don't volunteer that, uh, that, that uh, autophony of their voice and breathing. So you're gonna correlate this with your otoscopy. If you're in question, is there negative pressure? You can insufflate. Uh, active eustachian tube dysfunction will be associated with negative pressure and uh, with or without an effusion. It may be normal if they're only having trouble with flying. You'll correlate your findings with an audiogram and a tympanogram. They should have a conductive hearing loss if they have significant negative pressure or effusion. Type B or C tympanograms. Again, normal if they're only affected when they're barrow challenged. And then the, the endoscopy, angled exam, and most commonly I do that with the fiber optic, just like I showed you. So I can see the nose, sinuses, hypopharynx, larynx, looking for reflux, uh, rhinus sinusitis, other factors. So I, I like to do that efficiently with just the fiber. And we look specifically at the mucus, edema, erythema, lymphoid hyperplasia, that tubal tonsil, adenoid-like tissue, all signs of inflammation. And then how well does that valve open? So I, I call this a MILO assessment. That's my checklist for all the, all the bullet points I wanna look for during that endoscopy. When in doubt, you can do a myringotomy or a tube. If they've got a negative pressure problem, obstructive tubal dysfunction, it should relieve the symptoms. So beware when it doesn't relieve the symptoms, I'm thinking a diagnosis other than obstructive disease. Now, if they're looking, uh, if they're complaining about oral fullness, pressure, um, but you don't see inflammation, you don't see a muscular weakness problem, you don't see any other pathology, what else is going on? About 10% of our obstructive patients have a bony uh, eustachian tube lesion, some type of uh, scar or, or uh, fullness of uh, soft tissue in the bony portion, about 10% of our patients. Now you can figure that out when the middle ear is aerated, perforation or tube, and you get a CT, you'll see that soft tissue density in the, in the bony portion. And, and we'll sometimes uh, uh, instrument that with an illuminated guide wire, not FDA approved, uh, but that's technology that's coming. You have to ask about patchless autophony. Those patients who are clicking, popping, they're more likely to be patchless than actually obstructive dysfunction. Look for those excursions of the tympanic membrane with the ipsilateral nasal breathing. Watch out for the folks who sniff to control their symptoms. They can cause tympanic membrane retraction from the negative pressure of sniffing. So if they're sniffing and they've already got negative pressure in their ear, that's inappropriate. It's not habitual sniffing, it's inappropriate sniffing. They're doing it to control patchless symptoms. So watch out for those, they can fool us. Think about temporal mandibular disorders. So it's not just TMJ, the joint, it's more commonly the tight muscles of mastication, clenching, grinding. Um, and we pick that up on a bimanual exam of their muscles, intra, extra, oral. Conductive hearing losses. If you've got a flaccid tympanic membrane or, or circular chain, a lot of these patients will do popping and sniffing. Uh, Monahar Bantz calls them sniffer poppers. Um, they're doing frequent valsalvas to try to adjust their hearing. They can fool you. They'll blame it on their eustachian tube. Inner ear disorders, 
semicircular canal dehiscence, otic capsule dehiscence, and lymphatic hydrops, even just plain sensory neural hearing loss can present with a complaint of oral fullness, but, and you know how to sort all those out. There's even a lot of migraineers who will complain about oral fullness. I have to put that in there to satisfy our Hopkins uh, group. Um, this is just an overview of that algorithm that I use in the office every day for oral fullness, the differential diagnosis. So it, it's a pictorial version of uh, what I just showed you. So I'll, I'll give you a moment. You can snap a picture if you want. And if you want these slides when we're all done, they're all yours. Uh, it, all of my media is available to you. So why do patients with temporal mandibular disorders have oral fullness. It's so commonly confused with eustachian tube dysfunction. Uh, th these are cadaver slices from uh, Yannicka's textbook. So here is the medial cartilaginous lamina in the torus tubarius. And this is the lumen of the eustachian tube. Here is that membranous wall. There's the tensor veli palatini right there, the levator in the floor. And look at this, the medial pterygoid, the lateral pterygoid, they share a wall here. So these muscles can run along with the TVP. And so if you have any disorders with that, it will be perceived as aural fullness. So how do we sort that out? Um, this is the exam. It's a bimanual examination. My finger goes, index finger goes into the mouth, palpating the ramus of the mandible. And then the, uh, the inferior surface of the zygomatic arch. So initially, I'm going to go lateral to the, to the ramus and palpate the masseter muscle, feeling for hypertrophy, um, tender spots, tight uh, cords, spasms. And then we'll go medially into the pterygoid space and doing the same thing, feeling for similar uh, uh, bogginess. Um, these patients, when they're, uh, when they're having uh, uh, muscle tension there, they're going to be exquisitely tender as you just begin to put your finger into that space. Now you want to practice doing this on yourself because if you push too hard, you can cause discomfort or pain in, in, in anybody. So you want to learn what's the right amount of pressure and you'll very quickly see the difference when you, when you reach up there on a normal, you've got this nice open space, it's not tender uh, versus these patients who are full and exquisitely tender backing away from your finger. So we make the diagnosis and get them set up with our oral medicine specialist to manage that. So just a review of the clinical consensus statement from the American Academy. Uh, Deb Tusi led that and uh, Ed McCool was the vice chair. Uh, the first, uh, I was privileged to be a part of this too. Um, Bill, I think you might've been part of that. Um, so the first thing we had to do was to define obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction and it's defined by in impaired ability to equalize the pressure. So we know from uh, many studies, and especially this one from uh, Pau et al. in Germany, uh, they, did, uh, they avoided swallowing or yawning in these subjects for up to two hours to see what a tympanogram would do. And here you've got out to 60 minutes and you're already down to minus 100 by two hours, minus 170. And they all quit because it was getting too painful. So the middle ear gas exchange is absorbing gases steadily. And we've got to ventilate our eustachian tube and middle ear several times an hour to prevent this from happening. So if you've got an obstructive problem, that's going to be impaired. You're going to see negative pressure and you can see it as an effusion, retraction. Uh, you can measure it on the uh, tympanograms. Now, again, if they're barrow challenged only, they should have a strong, consistent history. And we're still going to be looking for pathology on endoscopy in all of these patients. Watch out for the fixed retraction pockets. They don't necessarily imply active eustachian tube dysfunction. This patient has a normal eustachian tube and a type A tympanogram. They probably had dysfunction in the past. The tympanic membrane, when it comes in contact with ossicles, sputum, middle ear mucosa, it causes upregulation of inflammatory mediators. And those mediators can cause epithelial spreading, fibrosis, adhesion, and eventually you get a retraction pocket that's 
uh, deepening, spreading, even turning into cholesteatoma from a biological process that's unrelated to what the eustachian tube is doing at that time. So uh, a progressive pocket does not necessarily mean that you have active eustachian tube dysfunction going on. So keep that in mind. So the indications for a balloon are chronic uh, symptoms, middle ear fusion or uh, negative pressure. So greater than three months was the definition. Type B or C tympanogram, you can measure it. And you see eustachian tube pathology on the endoscopy, that MILO assessment. Now, if they only have the barrow challenge problem, you won't see the uh, negative pressure during their office visit, but we still want to see the pathology you're going to operate on. So consistent history and eustachian tube pathology on that endoscopy. So the endoscopy is key as surgeons. You want to see the objective that you're going to be operating on. Um, you need a multidimensional evaluation that we just talked about and this has been confirmed. There's no one test for eustachian tube function. So that history and uh, otoscopic exam, audiometry, tympanometry, nasal endoscopy. Usually you can find some cause for the inflammation, allergic disease, uh, rhinosinusitis, reflux, or others, and you want to treat those appropriately. If they don't get better, that's when we resort to tympanostomy tubes, or now you can use a balloon. Um, the patient reported symptom scores, like the eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaire, they're symptom scores, outcomes. They don't differentiate between other causes of oral fullness. You cannot use them for a diagnosis. Um, the FDA approved balloon catheters have a calibration to avoid inserting into the bony eustachian tube. You don't want to be there. That's where the carotid is. Uh, but if you are using catheters that are uh, small enough to enter into the bony eustachian tube, make sure they're calibrated. Don't go beyond that 25 millimeters. Uh, if a tube does not help, remember, it's probably not obstructive disease, likely another diagnosis. Um, I, I believe you've seen these before. Uh, the balloon dilation, we really couldn't figure out why that was working. It was going against everything I expected. Uh, so we did the, this histological study, taking biopsies in the lumen, and we found that the balloon was shearing off the surface epithelium that was disorderly, swollen, loss of cilia, inflammatory infiltrate, shearing it off, but leaving the basal layer. And when you blow up the balloon, this was immediately after the, uh, uh, this is before a balloon, immediately after the balloon. It's crushing the lymphoid follicles, adenoid-like tissue, crushing them in the submucosa. So you see just minimal excoriation, even though histologically it's much more impressive. And we've gotten some specimens where we could see what's going on weeks later, and they all look like this. Restoration of the normal pseudocolumnar epithelium. Here is the cilia returned and the uh, submucosal adenoid-like tissue. It's gone. It's been replaced with thin scar, just like you'd see biopsies after doing an adenoidectomy. And that's when I realized what we're doing is we've stumbled on a technology that is acting like doing an adenoidectomy in the lumen of the eustachian tube. So it's just an extension of your tools to get to inflammatory disease. And uh, it may not be confined to just the eustachian tube. It could be the torus. So we do a lot of tubal tonsil removal, lateral adenoidectomy, cauterizing, uh, reducing the... Uh, inferior turbinates, whatever is necessary to control the problem. All right, so I'm going to go through some cases about how we make that assessment and what are we going to do to treat them. A 32-year-old male, tympanostomy tubes for effusion as a child, he outgrew it, but he's always had trouble with flights, consistent barrow challenge history. Last year, he got an upper respiratory infection. He's got persistent effusion, he required a myringotomy relieve the effusion, but now he's having increasing barrow challenges every time he flies. Today in your office, the exam is normal, audiograms normal, tympanograms are normal. Here's his eustachian tube. Left side, this is the endoscopy, there's the torus, and we see it's 
mildly inflamed. It's a little bit wet. Mucosa is a little thick. We see this band here of redundant mucosa that's quite uh, edematous. It's very pale. And when the patient opens, he gets a reasonable opening. So he's not having a problem currently. So I'm going to call that a grade two. Uh, there's, there is uh, mild inflammation, but it's not compromising the opening significantly. So what can you do for him? He wants to fly. He could have a tube. They don't want a tube usually just to fly. He's a great candidate for a balloon dilation. Uh, now, I'm, I only did one minute. He doesn't have a lot of inflammation and he's been able to fly fine ever since. Lesser inflammation, less balloon uh, dilation time. I don't want to make them patchless. Here's a 40 year old female, middle ear effusion, tympanostomy tubes as a child. She outgrew her symptoms on the left, but she chronically has fullness on the right <clears throat> and barrow challenge. Uh, Long standing allergic rhinitis. She gets middle ear effusions on the right side after upper respiratory infections, and they last days to weeks. It's a real issue for her. She's had tympanostomy tubes now as an adult three times on the right. She likes the tubes, they relieve her symptoms. And then the next upper respiratory infection that occurs after the tubes out, she gets the fullness and the hearing loss. And now she's had that for the past two months. She has retraction, but no effusion, mild air bone gap and high frequency conductive loss. Tympanogram, minus 390 on the right. Uh, she's got a perforation on the left. That's why she's asymptomatic. Here's her eustachian tube, right side. Robust tubal tonsil tissue, bulky cobblestoning. We see cobblestoning is going down into the lumen. We see two bands of redundant mucosa that are very bulky. Mild inflammation on the membranous wall. Bulky adenoid. Let's see if there's anterior thrusting when she swallows. That's a yawn, pretty good opening with a strong yawn. Here's a swallow in slow motion. So reasonably good opening there, no anterior thrusting. All right, well, she's got moderate inflammation here. Uh, some mild compromise of the opening here. And that's why she's able to get some air up there enough that she doesn't get an effusion. So what can we do for her? She could get another tube. She's a great candidate for a balloon dilation, but I wouldn't just do that. I think this tubal tonsil tissue needs to go. And I, would, and I trimmed her lateral adenoid here to get this burden of inflammation away from her eustachian tube. Now, you could concurrently also uh, fix that perforation on the left side. She didn't need it uh, because she didn't have a hearing loss with it. It wasn't causing problems, but you, you have that as an option. If you're going to do them concurrently, do the balloon first so you don't get any possible back pressure from the balloon when you inflate it to disrupt your fresh tympanoplasty. So do the balloon first. Here's a 51 year old male, obese, obstructive sleep apnea, former smoker, he quit two weeks ago. Sinusitis, uh, it's controlled after sinus disease, uh, sinus surgery, uh, but he still has ear problems. He's barrow challenged. He has chronic middle ear effusions after, uh, that persist af after upper respiratory infections. He's had tympanostomy tubes twice in the past five years. Uh, they relieve his symptoms when he gets it. So now he's got ear fullness, hearing loss, persisting after upper respiratory infection again. He's got an effusion, conductive hearing loss, negative pressure on the right. The left is a flat curve where he's got an effusion. Let's look at his eustachian tube, left side, thick, very fat torus. The inflammation, we don't see cobblestones, but the submucosa is clearly extremely thick. We don't see vessels. The adenoids just mildly touching the torus, doesn't look to be a factor. There's his ca, ca, ca. A little bit of anterior thrusting with that. There's a swallow. Wow, severe anterior thrusting. It's impacting the lumen here. There's his yawn. He's not able to open. This torus is too thick. Notice the membranous wall is not that inflamed. Here's his swallow in slow motion. Very severe anterior thrusting. Even though that adenoid is only barely touching the torus, the torus is so thick 
it's still causing severe anterior thrusting. So again, that static view, not very helpful. It's the dynamic exam where you really get the story. So he's grade four, he never opens. That's why he's got an effusion. What can we do? Could do another tube. Good candidate for a balloon dilation, but that's not gonna do it alone. He needed a big resection of this, of this uh, medial torus. I don't resect with a cautery, monopolar cautery. I don't go beyond the midpoint of the torus. That's, what the, that's for the balloon. Uh, so we're just the medial part, and then I can use that same cautery to get rid of the lateral adenoid. And in fact, uh, he had nasal obstruction. We reduced his turbinates as well with, uh, with a coblation. Here's an 18 year old male, had tubes as a kid. He's allergy tested positive for environmental allergens and uh, he treats himself PRN with nasal steroid sprays. He had a recent effusion, it lasted two weeks after an upper respiratory infection. So he's, it, although it's gone now, he's got an upcoming flight and he's worried, does he need something so that he'll be able to fly? Normal exam on his ear normal hearing, normal tympanograms. Here's his fiber optic exam with a pediatric scope. We use a pediatric, that's his adenoid, pediatric scopes in all the teenagers and especially males, they're like prone to turn pale and start to faint on us. So here's his right torus, huge cobblestoning. The torus is enormous. Adenoid hypertrophy, it's impacting on the torus. Doesn't look good. How's the lumen? He's got some cobblestone going into the lumen. Membranous wall's perfectly fine. No inflammation there. So let's see what happens when he does his maneuvers. The lumen actually looks quite good here. Here's a swallow in slow motion. Levator, tensor, no anterior thrusting. It opens actually quite well. That's why he's got a normal exam. Otherwise, so even though he's got grade three inflammation, moderate inflammation, even extending into the lumen, it doesn't go into the valve itself of significance. So I don't want to do a balloon dilation, especially allergic rhinitis. He might be prone to being patchless. Um, so continue to manage his allergies. And we just talked about what to do on flights. We do like those airplane plugs that you guys invented. Um, the uh, uh, he, he can bring a nasal decongestant with him, uh, an oral decongestant as well. Use them if needed. Nasal steroid spray, allergic disease. I always recommend that beginning at least three days prior. It takes three to five days to get uh, a maximal benefit out of those sprays. And taught him to do the modified Valsalva. He was able to do it in the office. Instructed him to do it during his scent. He flew just fine. This patient's 64, male, tympanostomy tubes three times as a child, adenoidectomy. His complaint is he needs to pop his left ear all the time or sniff to optimize his hearing. And he's frustrated. He pops, he sniffs, and he cannot, uh, he can get his hearing to uh, be optimized, but only briefly after a few seconds, his ear pops in it uh, and he loses his hearing again. So he's very, uh, very concerned with this. He's been referred for a eustachian tube balloon dilation. He has no barrel challenge history. Here's his exam. Left side, he's got some retraction onto the uh, incus there, but no erosion. Very thin atrophic flaccid tympanic membrane. It's retracted at the present. And he's doing a uh, modified Valsalva there, which he does easily all the time. And you, you can see that with virtually no effort, he can just blow that right out. It's still tethered to the incus. He's got a conductive hearing loss as you'd expect. When he came in to panograms, negative pressure because he just sniffed. Here's his eustachian tube, left side. We see the vessels clearly, mucosa's thin. He's got a little redundant band of uh, mucosa there, but it's not swollen. We don't see that pale, thick edema. Ka, 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 moves the torus beautifully. There's the ka, ka, ka. 
There's a swallow, it opens fine. And now we'll look at a yawn, opens beautifully. This is a normal exam, completely normal. He has no compromise of his opening and no inflammation. There's a slow motion swallow, normal opening. So he's adjusting his tension on the tympanic membrane to adjust his hearing. And he's frustrated because all of his popping and sniffing are being undone by his normal eustachian tube. So it's not a eustachian tube dysfunction, it's functioning normally. But he's been blaming his eustachian tube because it won't sustain his hearing improvements that he's trying to generate. He needs a cartilage tympanoplasty. If we balloon dilate him, he'll become possibly patchless. All right, here's the last case. 48-year-old male, persistent middle ear fusion, lifelong allergic rhinitis. In his childhood, he had recurrent acute otitis media, but he's outgrown that. And then suddenly 10 years ago, he got a bad upper respiratory infection, bilateral middle ear effusions, and he's needed tympanostomy tubes ever since. Five tubes, allergy testing was negative, and his examination, he's got retracted tympanic membranes, middle ear effusion, quite severely retracted. Here it's atelectasis. He's even getting a little crusting here in this pocket, bordering on cholesteatoma. Conductive hearing losses, tympanograms, severe negative pressure, minus 475, minus 570. How do you get such severe negative pressure without just filling up with an effusion and getting a flat tympanogram? That's supposed to happen about minus 400 level. How do you get that? That's a red flag. Here's this exam. This is a fiber optic right side. Taurus looks normal. Thin, healthy mucosa. We see the little gentle folds. So let's look into the lumen. Got to see both walls. And we're seeing no evidence of inflammation whatsoever. There's a little mucus here blocking the view of the valve. Let's try and get a better view. There we go. Now we can see into the valve. And we've got to look quite deep to get there. He's got a concavity here in the, in the cartilaginous wall, the anterolateral wall. What's going on with this valve? There's a swallow, now a yawn. The valve is staying open all the time. He just popped that little bit of mucus that was there. This is a patchless eustachian tube. Now, I didn't suspect that based on his examination and his history initially. So I asked him about autophony and absolutely. Oh yeah, voice, breathing. Oh, this sounds so loud. I have to sniff all the time, strongly as he demonstrated for me to, get, uh, to keep my symptoms under control, but it only lasts a few seconds. He's sniffing so strongly that he's generating those severe negative pressures but he doesn't fill up with an effusion because he's patchless. After a few seconds, he aerates it partially again. So watch out for these patchless patients, the inappropriate sniffing. You shouldn't want to sniff if you've already got negative pressure. It's usually because they're patchless and they are doing it to relieve their symptoms, at least transiently. So briefly, uh, an update on Balloon dilation results, uh, two randomized con uh, controlled trials to date. Uh, both of them looked at objective measures with tympanograms. These were done for FDA approval. Uh, the FDA wanted us to look at normalization of tympanograms. So the results are much more severe than just simply uh, improvements, statistically significant improvements. And uh, you could have a type C tympanogram in a perfectly uh, asymptomatic patient. So your clinical results would be better than what you see here. Uh, the treatment groups got the balloon plus six weeks of nasal steroids in these studies versus the control group that only got the six weeks of nasal steroids and all of these had chronic refractory uh, uh, dysfunction. So normalization of tympanograms far better in the treatment group versus the control group 51.8 versus 13.9. And the eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaire is the symptom scores, 56.2 versus 8.5. Strongly significantly significant 
for the treatment group. Uh, the second study, similar results with a strongly significant treatment group over the control group and the uh, dysfunction scores, significant improvement versus no, no significant improvement in the control group. Now, there have been a, several systematic reviews and meta-analyses now of heterogeneous uh, case retrospective studies. Even though they've been heterogeneous, they've all shown significant improvement in their outcome scores, Valsalva's, otoscopy, tympanometry, and whatever eustachian tube scores they were using. And these are big, big numbers. So they've all shown benefit. And the studies that have had follow-up for two or more years, they're all showing that the results are durable over time. Retrospective studies, and this is the uh, prospective randomized controlled trial that went out to 29 months um, of their uh, follow-up uh, for a mean, and our results held up after 12 months. So we think that durability is because of those histological uh, results that I showed you earlier. It's actually causing histological changes. Pediatrics, uh, it's coming. It's already proved in, in uh, Europe. The Germans were the first to do this. Tisch and Meyer group, uh, 75, 80% success without needing tympanostomy tubes in, in children. Jenkel's group, not quite as good improvement, 64%. Uh, and then Tish and Myers teamed up with Sudhoff. Uh, his group was the first to do balloon dilations, uh, to publish balloon dilations, also in adults, and 80% improvement. So uh, significant improvement in children. This is our experience. So uh, off-label, of course, 26 patients, 46 eustachian tubes uh, in our uh, each group. So what, what you're seeing here uh, are patients who typically had uh, two or more prior tympanostomy tubes. Most of them, almost all of them had adenoidectomy and they're needing tubes again. So one group got the balloon dilation and we've matched, we, retrospectively, we matched a cohort for age, sex, and all of those other factors to see what the natural history was if they didn't get a, temp, uh, a balloon. And what you see here on these Kaplan-Meier curves is here's the balloon group, very statistically significant different outcomes from the tympanostomy only group who needed repeated tubes. And this was out to two years. Now, a separate group, um, uh, these are operated by Mark Dean in Texas, and we matched them with our control group in uh, Children's Hospital because we have uh, such an extensive database. And you see very similar results and without the five years of follow-up. So it does work in pediatrics. In fact, it works so well. We've had a few patchless symptoms, uh, at least temporarily. And uh, so I don't, if they're under 20, I don't do more than one and a half minute of balloon dilation. They're, they're actually at more, uh, they're more sensitive to the balloon and uh, the, uh, 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 we don't want to get those patchless symptoms. So one and a half minute max. Just some words about patchless eustachian tube. These are uh, extreme examples, of very large concave defect and large excursions of the tympanic membrane. Um, so in the evaluation, you do want to see those excursions with ipsilateral nasal breathing. And if you don't see them, you can do a reflex decay mode tympanometry. And you can see those when they're doing their uh, ipsilateral nasal breathing, nose and mouth otherwise closed, and uh, it's more sensitive than your otoscopic exam. These are all patchless eustachian tubes. 30% of our patchless eustachian tubes look like this, evidence of chronic ear disease, and they probably started out with tubal dysfunction, obstructive dysfunction. This one's even got a cholesteatoma, and they eventually developed atrophy with patchless symptoms. So again, just because you've got a cholesteatoma, it doesn't assume, you can't assume that they still have active eustachian tube obstructive dysfunction. It may be on the contrary. The most common comorbidity we found is allergic disease. So we're now highly suspicious about the possibility for patchless 
in patients with chronic allergic disease. Weight loss came in second, 35%. Reflux, 33 Stress and anxiety. Those people who are clenching, tensing, a lot of them have temporomandibular disorders and that those pterygoid muscles are distracting on the eustachian tube. It can actually cause it to pop open. So the future, I think, is very bright. Um, we need randomized controlled trials of the balloon dilation, longer follow-up to really determine its long-term uh, role, especially in pediatrics. Now, we found that a balloon can reduce inflammation, but there's way more better, better means for reducing inflammation with medications. So I think that's the future. Um, topicals, slow release drug delivery, that is more targeted. You could use nanoparticles. You could deliver anti-inflammatories. All the things we're looking at for otitis media. Um, Transtympanic delivery of such things. So Jeff Harris's group uh, with the, the autonomy company is already looking at those things. Dan Kohane uh, here at Children's Hospital, he has chemical permeators that he's curing acute otitis media in chinchillas with topical drops. Imagine that uh, worldwide especially in developing countries. Uh, Sujana Chandrasekhar has been doing surfactant sprays in the nose, uh, not yet to be approved, but uh, some really promising uh, results in her animal studies. Um, steroid eluding stents, Brian Weeks in San Diego uh, was the first to do that. And I've done that for some of our uh, reconstruction patients. Eustachian tube surgery, instead of doing tubes as a primary therapy, I'm not there yet, these balloons are expensive, but they're doing it in, in Germany and other parts of Europe. As uh, the technology improves with, techno with uh, navigation, microendoscopes, lasers, micro robotics, we'll be able to get into those bony eustachian tubes. Uh, and and uh, that right now where that's still a limit of our technology. We need better treatments for patchless, topical medical therapy. Uh, more permanent injectables. Uh, we can do hydroxyapatite off-label here, but it doesn't last. Uh, in the UK, they've got permanent uh, injectables and they are uh, off-label, but they are working. We need commercial shims instead of these angia catheters that I'm using. And we need to know a lot more about the path of physiology and the mechanisms of action of these therapeutics. So to conclude, this eustachian tube, it's complex. It needs a multi-dimensional evaluation with that history, otoscopy, audiometry, tympanometry, that dynamic nasal exam. And I hope you have a little better understanding of what to look for. Becoming familiar with both of those walls, left side, torus, the cartilaginous wall, the membranous wall, and looking for evidence of inflammation. It's usually treatable. Some, uh, the majority of our patients who come to me for a balloon wind up not getting it we wind up finding the cause of their inflammation. They go on and get allergy treatments or whatever. We do a lot of testing and uh, the majority get better and don't need a balloon. Um, watch out for those fixed retractions. They don't imply active eustachian tube uh, dysfunction. Um, and I just wanna thank, uh, thank you again um, for this tremendous opportunity to speak with you. I'd like to also remind you about our annual course that we didn't get to do last year. Uh, we were going to give it again virtual this year in May. And uh, Dr. Slattery reminded me that he joined us for our very first program uh, where we assembled 22 people and we went to surgery and we did dissections and we talked about how to uh, plan this research on the eustachian tube for the next bunch of years. And he reminded me today that was 16 years ago. So Bill, we've come a long way and I owe it to you and so many other colleagues. Uh, this has been an enormous team effort to get to where we are. So again, it's a, a real honor to be able to speak with you today. Um, your group is uh, just a tremendous world, comp world uh, wide, wide contributions and we all admire what you've all done. Uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, collaborate with you and thank you so much for this, this opportunity. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, Neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. 
Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.